everybody uh, for joining us today for our first of Tuesday Tobin Talks. And I'm going to turn it over to Mark Tobin, our ADL Southwest Regional Director. Yeah, thank you, Margie. Uh, and thanks all for uh, being here. Uh, look, January 6th was a direct attack on our democracy. Uh, it was also the most predictable terrorist attack uh, in our modern history of the United States. And we cannot let the days leading up uh, to an inauguration day itself uh, become what the, uh, the whole nation watched in horror last week, uh, simply because our heads were stuck in the sand uh, and too many ignore what extremists themselves are telling the whole world they are hoping to do. Um, this goes for law enforcement, social media companies, um, and our nation's leaders. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to kind of go through how ADL has responded uh, to the events of January 6th and what uh, we are looking to do in the days leading up to the inauguration and beyond. Uh, and I've also asked our uh, ADL Regional Board Chair, Mark Trachtenberg, uh, to join me and uh, ask him to say a few words as well about his thoughts about the events of January 6th. And uh, so Mark, uh, why don't you start us off uh, before I kind of go through um, ADL's response. Thank you for being here, Mark. Sure, good afternoon to everybody. You know, two of the things I, I learned about in my December board remarks, the rise of domestic extremism and the power of social media to spread lies, to incite and to indoctrinate, came together last Wednesday in the mob assault on the Capitol, one of the darkest days in the history of our country on parallel to December 7th, 1941, 9-11, 2001. And this horrific attack shows the fragility of our democracy where millions of people have been radicalized via the internet to believe in QAnon conspiracy theories, lies about election fraud, and, uh, and, and, and the like. And as awful as Wednesday was, uh, sadly, it could have been, I, mean, it, I think it's important to understand it could have been much worse. We could have easily had a massacre of our elected officials. I think it's also important to understand that the threat has not passed. Capitol Police briefed congressional officials yesterday, last night, about three other impending extremist plots you know, leading up to the inauguration, including a plot to assassinate de Democratic congressmen outside the Capitol um, so that the GOP can retake charge of, of Congress. We've seen reports of congressmen, including our own Al Green, threatened at airports, on airplanes, in their home offices. There are some reports that congressmen felt compelled to vote against certification of the vote for fear of harm to themselves and family and their families. And there are other threats being reported about actions uh, in, against in, in other state legislatures, other other protests, mobs, et cetera, uh, that you know that uh, could be assembling across the country. Um, and I think. I'm alarmed also by reports that extremists have infiltrated law enforcement, secret service, the military. We have we have reports of police officers uh, from across the country, uh, you know, uh, attending the march. We have reports of military officers attending the uh, attending the march. Secret service officers posting these ludicrous theories on Facebook. That there's been reports that we may even need counter snipers at the inauguration to protect against people in the National Guard or, or that should be protecting elected officials um, in case in case they try to take action. It, it, I mean, I, I, it's hard to understate how dangerous of a situation we're in right now. But I do want to say uh, um, we are at the vanguard. I am so proud of the work the ADL has done and it has been doing over the past you know, many months, our work has never been more important. We've been working with, and I think Mark will get into the details of this, but we've been working with the Department of Justice and the FBI to identify the extremists that participated in this model. <laughs> uh, we've been working and advocating for uh, deep platforming of people, including the president, who have been inciting uh, the violence and uh, as part of our Stop Hate for Profit campaign. And, um, and, and uh, I know we'll be advocating 
uh, strongly when the new administration takes office <coughs> to, get the, to get the Department of Homeland Security focused on this domestic extremist threat. So uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we need to do everything we can to um, get the message out, strengthen the ADL, because we are at the vanguard of a fight and the fight is whether we continue as a democracy. And I can't emphasize enough uh, the, the importance of the work we're doing and um, just really proud as always to be part of this critical organization. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, and, and for, for laying out uh, the concerns and, and the issues uh, as well as you did. So, you know, look, you're exactly right. And um, uh, Oren Siegel, who heads our Center on Extreme Extremism, you know, expressed it really well when he said that, um, you know, when he would open up his computer on a regular basis uh, and he looked at his agenda, you know, hate groups, extremists, social media, uh, that is what's on the news every day right now. And so our agenda is what is the news. So we are front and center and uh, fortunately, uh, because of, of y'all support and, and work, uh, and the work that we have been doing for, for months and for years, um, we are positioned uh, to directly impact um, events. And so what I wanna do uh, today, uh, and I do wanna make sure that we have plenty of time, time for, for Q&A as well, but just kind of lay out um, what ADL has been doing um, in all our different facets. Um, so, you know, the, the other thing is, is that, you know, if you look at our, our website, um, you know, I talked about this being a predictable um, attack. Our, our website almost could be a roadmap to predicting, uh, you know, the events of, of January 6th. Um, it, it's important to understand who took part. Uh, everybody who took part um, in the violence of January 6th, they were united by um, one particular element, um, and that was uh, their support for Donald Trump in view that the election was stolen. Um, however, uh, beyond that, uh, there were a lot of differences amongst the people. Uh, they were essentially divided up into two uh, different groups. There were uh, people who had been part of extremist groups for uh, quite some time. Uh, those are the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, uh, Graper Army, America First, New Jersey European Heritage Association, QAnon. You've heard these names before. Um, and then uh, there were others who are who were either recently radicalized or even radicalized um, at the event. And these would fall into the category, I guess, of, of sort of Trump radicals. Uh, these were people who sort of fit more into mainstream descriptions meaning they weren't wearing uh, the insignias of these uh, extremist groups uh, that you see noted um, in the media uh, and have the symbols that, you know, we've been identifying, uh, you know, on our, on our website. Um, many of these people have been hearing the conspiracy theories and lies over these past few years. Uh, they believe uh, with all their heart that the election has been stolen from them. Uh, they went to Washington. Uh, in, in order to be part of this rally. Uh, and they were motivated, directly motivated by what they heard. Um, and when the president said, uh, you know, go to the Capitol, uh, they did. And, and they got, uh, you know, some just perhaps got caught up in the moment, but they did become radicalized at that time. Um, and where that movement goes from here uh, certainly is not clear, um, but is something that we are going to be paying particular attention to. Uh, by way of example, after Charlottesville, uh, we were able to identify uh, a number of, uh, of people because they were known extremists. And while we've been able to do that in this case as well, the number is lower uh, because a lot of the people who have taken part um, are, are new. Um, and, and that is uh, something that, that is, uh, it is, it is, it is concerning uh, because of their recent radicalization. Um, these are, uh, so, so you essentially had two people, you had the extremists who were, uh, or more organized and, and then you had, uh, the, the sort of the pro Trump, uh, radicals, uh, who were not as organized and you saw a mix, 
of, of these two groups uh, you know, pushing and, and entering the capital. Um, and that's why you saw some people um, acting in certain ways. Some people looked like they had uh, a true agenda um, and other people looked like they were perhaps just milling about. Um, some uh, you know, were more intent on engaging in violence uh, and uh, insurrection and some, as I said, looked like they were just uh, kind of there. Um, there were um, some, uh, you know, the, the boogaloo types were there. They viewed this as just uh, another step towards a, a coming civil war in which the government, um, you know, supposedly coming for their guns. You had the accelerationists and militant white supremacists who, uh, who seek to, to make chaos um, as necessary for the destruction of, of this society so that they can build um, a new one more to their, to their liking. So you had all these components, um, but as I said, they were united by uh, their support for, for Donald Trump and belief that the election um, had been stolen. Uh, so, so what did we do? Um, I mentioned our Center on Extremism uh, and Mark mentioned about our work with law enforcement. We've been sharing information on uh, extremists long before January 6th. Um, our goal was to bring down the threat level by identifying extremists both before and during and after January 6th, and we're continuing to do that. Um, so far, uh, there have been over 100 arrests. Uh, the uh, federal law enforcement authorities have opened up over 200 investigations, even if it's minor. They're ranging from destruction of property, destruction of federal property, uh, to murder. Um, and there's, you know, we'll you know, talk a little bit more about the deep platforming that Mark mentioned, uh, but some people have raised the concern is, you know, what happens if you push them off of the more mainstream uh, platforms? Uh, we, we do, just so you all know, have the ability to track and follow um, as they migrate uh, to other platforms. Um, one important point is, you know, just because we were able to predict January 6th, doesn't mean that, you know, if we just continue to do as we are, uh, that we'll always be able to do that. We have to keep up with changes and uh, we have to continue to evolve uh, and we will continue to do that um, with, with your help. Um, our Center on Technology and Society, uh, which started, uh, I think about three, four years ago, um, what did they do during this time? Number one, uh, they were tracking online reactions uh, to January 6th. They were helping to retain uh, evidence. So for example, uh, people's Twitter feed, particularly before it was taken down and Parler uh, before it was taken down. Uh, they were working on uh, behind the scenes in terms of what needed to be deplatformed in order to keep people from inciting violence um, and spreading hate and conspiracy theories that were then inciting additional violence, working with our coalition, Stop Hate for Profit, uh, so that this was a broad effort uh, in order to include um, our partners. Um, and then working with providers of, uh, of applications like Apple and Google and domain registration providers as well. And also an important piece is working with sellers of hate products. So for example, many of y'all have seen the, the Camp Auschwitz shirt um, that was available online. And so, uh, uh, we are, you know, working with those that, that sell it online in order to get them to pull that. And uh, I know I've received a number of emails uh, over the past year, people who have seen those online, whether it's on Amazon or other uh, platforms, please, if you uh, continue to find uh, those kinds of products for sale, please file an incident report. It's important that we, uh, that we continue to track that and continue to uh, to, to, to seek out uh, those that are hosting third-party sellers uh, in order to, uh, to have those removed. Um, communications has been a very, very critical point. We started off on social media uh, and then we issued statements first condemning the attack uh, very, very harshly. And then on January 8th, uh, for the first time in ADL's history, we called for a president's removal. Uh, we also posted a number of additional uh, of resources. And uh, Marjorie, thank you for posting uh, the, the landing page for all of those. Uh, another a number of blog posts um, and also some educational resources, which are included. And I think Marjorie will post as well. 
Um, one is on uh, discussing political violence and extremism with young people, and the other was on the dangers of disinformation. And, and quite frankly, these are uh, resources which are, uh, I think, helpful to anybody, not just uh, not just kids. Uh, in the media, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt has appeared all over CNN, MSNBC, Bloomberg, and we, ADL, has been featured, I think, in just about every major print and online news um, outlet, uh, whether it's quotes or just talking about the work that we've been doing. Uh, so uh, it just indicates how involved we are um, on this issue. Uh, it's important to note that anti-Semitism and racism has been uh, mixed in uh, with the events of January 6th. Um, you know, the aforementioned Camp Auschwitz shirts and all the other symbols you've seen, the, the swastika flags, nooses, high Hitler salutes, uh, all this echoes what we witnessed in Charlottesville more than three years ago. Uh, what do we see coming up? Uh, there are signs about uh, pre-inauguration and inauguration day protests between January 16th and 20th. Um, and there's also signs of what the extremist movement uh, may be uh, looking to do to continue into the next administration. Uh, We're certainly tracking the right-wing extremists uh, who involved in, in this attempted coup, um, and particularly in what they're saying on social media, wherever uh, they are right now. Um, extremists right now are, are planning large-scale efforts with an eye on the inauguration day. Uh, uh, Mark talked about some of the precautions that are being taken. Uh, but there's uh, increased chatter about uh, potential armed protests in all 50 states between the 16th and, and 20th, uh, running up to, uh, to Inauguration Day. Um, and so we'll see in terms of what actually comes to fruition. Uh, but uh, the, the conspiratorial baseless narrative of a stolen election uh, will continue to animate um, extremists of all types, uh, we believe, for, for some time to come. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, some of the uh, platforms have now uh, sought to, uh, to eliminate uh, the, the content around that because it is now used for incitement of, of violence. Uh, when we'll continue, of course, to, to collaborate with local, state, and federal law enforcement partners and in sharing intelligence and identifying uh, existing and emerging threats. Uh, one thing that um, I want to share with you, and we're going to go through this together because it just came out. Um, is a poll that we put out. And so if you please bear with me one second. Um, this is on American attitudes towards extremist threats. And it's a survey following the events of the US Capitol. Um, and so we're actually gonna go through this together because I really haven't had a chance to go through it at all. Uh, it's uh, to what extent do you think the following individuals or groups are responsible for the violence in the US Capitol? Um, just so you know, the dark blue means significantly responsible and the lighter blue means somewhat. So uh, in terms of Donald Trump, 53 is significantly and another 14 somewhat. And then you can see next uh, members of white uh, supremacist far right militia groups, 47 and 17. Next, uh, social media. Below that, congressional Republicans uh, who opposed uh, certification. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Below that, Antifa receiving a total of uh, 40 percent, and um, Joe Biden receiving um, 16 and 11. How concerned are you about violence in America over the next year from the following groups or movements? I'll let you look at that while I grab a sip of water here. So obviously you can see that there's a, a lot of concern. And I, I think that's it. So with that, um, there's a there's a lot of information and in, uh, that, that we're putting out uh, literally all the time and even during this call right now. So we'll continue to update you as we know more. Uh, so, but I'm gonna stop there and um, ask for questions. Can I, can I give an update? That's uh, sure. just in the last few seconds. 
So like you said, even on this call, I, I have been talking to a detective from the Tomball Police Department and to an assistant special agent in charge of the FBI about the vandalism of the um, Tomball office of Michael McCall, Representative Michael McCall. I don't know if you all saw the article in the Chronicle, but his office was vandalized over the weekend. Um, they wrote Swamp Trader on the front of his office. And so I've been working to connect the FBI with the Tomball Police Department about this particular incident. A Tomball detective called me, which speaks to our relationship with law enforcement, and um, said, do you have any information on this and any information on any further threats? And I told her I would uh, certainly check on that and connect her with the FBI. So we're working up to the second on all this stuff. Um, thank you, Dean. Um, I'm sorry, my voice is a little craggly here, but uh, yeah, Mark, go ahead. I was just going to say, that's just part of the pattern. We, I expect to see more of, of intimidation of, uh, of elected officials through threats of violence, you know, in all places. I mean, it's not, you know, it's going to, it's, this is, and, and how do we keep good people from, you know, from going into public service with, um, with this, you know, threat of violence all around them and having them vote the right way. It's, it's just incredibly alarming. Does anybody have any questions for Mark, Mark, or Dina? We have a few minutes left. I do. I'm sorry, who's, who is that? I, I'm not seeing uh, the... My dad. Oh, Dan. <laughs> uh, Dan, hey, how are you? Hey, how are y'all? Good. Uh, you may have covered this in, in, in essence, but I guess my question is like in the neighborhood I live in and the community that I'm most involved with, how aware are they of the anti-Semitic aspect of what's going on um, and whether or not that should be emphasized to people in our own community who may not recognize it or admit it uh, and who should be at the forefront of the the battle that ADL is is waiting. So when you say they, I'm you're referring to law enforcement or no? I'm talking about Jewish people in my community and neighborhood who I I live amongst. Orthodox. They don't know where you. They're. Are. A, I, I mean, I I don't want to point fingers at Orthodox, but it is an Orthodox community that I live in, and. Um, I don't think they're getting the message. Um, look, there, there's a, we, we know, and there's a, there's a bubble issue with a number of communities and that, that, and that, that people are not uh, always, um, you know, receiving all the information or they're only receiving information from from one or two sources, um, or or um, and those sources may not always be, you know, providing the full story. Or they, uh, in some cases, and I'm not saying this is a case of what you're talking about, or they may be getting just conspiracies and lies. So it it may vary. It's a problem uh, that we're facing all around the country, and uh, that's that's one of the reasons why we are so focused. On, uh, on cyber with our, our Center for Technology and, and Society. You know, we, we're talking, the things we're talking about lately in terms of the, the deep platforming, I mean, a lot of these are really short-term solutions because we are focused right now on protecting the country in the, in the very short term, meaning we want to stop the incitement, we want to stop the imminent threats that are, that are taking place um, particularly through the through inauguration. Um, and the longer term solutions are much more complex than just, you know, removing people from from Twitter and removing, you know, their ability to to espouse incitement and hate. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some pieces of legislation that we are considering 
um, and I know some other groups are as well. Uh, but it's going to take more than legislation. It's going to take more than um, than deplatforming. It's going to take uh, the social media companies uh, in order for them to to do some some rethinking. Um, but it's also going to take uh, the part of our leadership uh, because it, it's one of these things where if it was just social media, okay. But if it, you know, but when you throw in political leadership who then uh, uh, leverages the conspiracy and lies for their own political gain, you know, that's, that's where it really becomes dangerous. And it's a combination of all these factors. Yeah, I think Dina had her hand up. She wanted to say. Yeah, in. I mean, I have, a, I have another aspect of that that I can speak to, Dan. I, and I don't know, when you say you live in the Orthodox community, specifically, which Orthodox community you're talking about, but as far as the Chabad community is concerned, they have a security uh, rabbi who is very much in touch with everything that's going on. And we don't really do security for the Jewish community anymore at ADL, but because I have worked in that for years, I know about this rabbi, his name's Chaim Lazaroff, he makes sure that Chabad's are very secure and very up to date on everything that's going on. So I think as far as that aspect of the Orthodox community is concerned, they're kind of well positioned to know what's happening. Is, does, is that helpful? Is that part of what you wanted to know? Sort of. I mean, the, the community, I, li I live in Fondren Southwest and if I throw a rock, I can hit five different synagogues uh, and about a hundred rabbis of various Orthodox, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Chabad, they're all within walking distance of my house. I just think that there's a lot of uh, support for the current president and uh, they may be uh, carrying guns to protect themselves if anybody were to attack one of their synagogues. But I don't necessarily think they're in supportive of, of the needed effort uh, that's, in, that's, that's needed to fight this, this battle that it does involve their politics. Yes. I'll just say ADL is putting out plenty of information about who these people are and what movements are represented in the, in the assault on the Capitol. And we have to do, you know, we have to make sure that information is disseminated and with, you know, hopefully it breaks through with some people, but they have to, they, people need to know who, the, who, what the ideologies are of the people that are uh, participating in this all across the country. And ADL has done a great job of, through extensive research that we've already done, identifying what, what these ideologies are, what these people stand for, and you know, which groups are represented. Yeah, uh, Gary. Gary, how are you? Yeah, I'm just fine, Mark. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, a question I had that I have not heard uh, any of the organizations talk about, uh, including on a national basis, is what influence uh, foreign parties might have had uh, in this. We know they <clears throat> run disinformation campaigns. Uh, they're um, uh, try to influence and divide uh, people. And one of their uh, methods is anti-Semitism, uh, stirring that pot. So I wonder if you could uh, visit that a little bit, please. I mean, I, I think you, you probably quite frankly, sort of covered it, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, to, you know, I, I don't think we've, we, we have any particular information. I mean, I can double check uh, in terms of sort of disseminating, separating between, you know, what disinformation might be coming from a foreign entity or not. Um, and, uh, you know, we do know that that it's that it's happened and, and it's been fairly prevalent, and um, they've certainly leveraged 
um, that, you know, on social media and, and uh, with whatever intent, you know, they, they might have. But, but um, in particular, uh, I couldn't tell you, you know, right. sort of any direct line uh, to particularly, you know, January 6th or anything like that. I, well, can I just throw in, I, I, I think we, you know, it's Russia, I mean, Russia and, and other hostile actors um, have been um, injecting poison into the information stream and amplifying um, things like stop the steal uh, for, for, you know, for a while. It would, it would not be a surprise. I think there's been reporting about uh, a number of laptops and computers stolen in this uh, in the Capitol siege, several, I think seven or eight of which had access to top secret clearance. I don't think there's been any reporting about this, but it certainly would shock me if there were uh, foreign elements that were uh, took advantage of the chaos uh, and to, to uh, infiltrate the Capitol. And uh, this is, I, I'm not seeing anything, I'm not, I'm speculating, so I'll make clear that, that this is not something based on reporting I've seen, but I have seen hard reporting about the number of classified computers that have been stolen. And it would be more surprising to me if some of the people, the groups that were, we know were infiltrating would have, um, would have focused on thefts of those computers. So I, I think that's a, it's a very good question. And I think we'll, we'll have to just see what future reporting shows but I think that I think the threat that the questioner raised is a very legitimate, a le very legitimate one. There may be a foreign element uh, that is uh, in play here. Anyone else? Anyone else? I know we're over we're over time, um, I so I, Josh, I appreciate y'all uh, thinking around, sticking around. Josh Zwicky had a question in the chat box about whether. We were considering the resonate calling for the resignation or removal of Ted Cruz as we did for Trump. I'm guessing that's a decision that we made at the national level, Mark. Well, yeah, um, right now that's not something that we that I believe it will we'll be weighing into. Um, so uh, look, just once again, first of all, thank y'all uh, for for joining and thank y'all for your for your interest. Uh, this is a obviously extraordinarily dynamic um, situation. And, and um, just wanted to relate to y'all that um, all facets of, of ADL are engaged uh, from, from the regions to, to every part of, of CSE, our national offices. Uh, and we are um, intent on doing everything we can using all the expertise that we have uh, uh, developed over the years um, in order to, uh, to to help prevent uh, the, uh, quite frankly, the 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 dis, uh, descent of our democracy, uh, and to uh, secure um, a safe transfer of power, uh, which is uh, a, the a key to a uh, a strong democracy. Um, ultimately, we know that um, the, the Jews and, and, and every minority and every person is better off in a strong democracy. And so uh, we will fight uh, as strongly as we have ever fought um, in order to make sure that, um, that we withstand um, these efforts. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, Iris, you have, you have a question? Iris, you're on mute. On mute? No, I just wanted to thank you. Um, thank all of you for this update. It's been very informative. And oh, you're welcome. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, Mark, could I just make a 30 second comment? This is Josh Zwickle. I'm, I'm part of the GL, current GLI class for, for Houston. And just, oh, thank just you. wanted to let this group know that we're actually getting together virtually tonight to, to kind of discuss what we can do and how we can help. So just wanted to, to let you all know that that was happening. Oh, great. Great. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah. And thanks for this. These are, I try to join these when I can and they're always 
you know, terrifying but informative. So, <laughs> well, we uh, you know, describe it right we now. try to we try to focus on the latter, but uh, sometimes you just can't help it. So, um, well, uh, listen, we as I said, we 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 will strive to keep y'all informed um, as uh, as as we know more. Uh, so so stay tuned and um, we'll be in touch. And also, uh, please know tonight at seven uh, in partnership with Congregation Beth Israel. Um, uh, Eric, Eric, Eric Ward. Okay, I always want to say, yes, Eric Ward uh, will be speaking um, uh, virtually and uh, he is a uh, He's a really kind of don't miss kind of speaker. So uh, if you haven't registered, um, please, please do sign up. Uh, Marv, you already put something in the chat box, I think. Um, and uh, he spoke to our Never Is Now in 2019. He was on a panel um, and about uh, basically issues around uh, racism. Um, and he's, he's phenomenal. So, so don't miss. Uh, tonight it's 7 o'clock. Yeah, um, I I need to mention that seven o'clock Central Time. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I uh, hope y'all can join, and thank y'all again for sticking around a little bit late. Thank Appreciate you. it. Take care. Bye bye.